going to work in Hollywood and film editing. But the coursework was extremely intense, easily 20 hour days, six or seven days a week, easily between classwork, studio time, and out shooting out, you know, if we were out of the school shooting someplace or in a dark room. So I just burned out, frankly. And when I came back home, camera went in the bag, my beautiful Nikon in the bag, and I then took a job in New York City, and the camera virtually stayed in the bag for 35 years. I'd bring it out once in a while to photograph this or that, but for the most part, didn't touch photography at all for 35 years. The kind of sad part about it, now that I think about it, is that my job took me anywhere north of the equator, essentially. So I traveled quite a bit in Asia, quite a bit in Western Europe, Central, not Central America, but Mexico as well, and all any small town that had a paper mill in North America, I've been there. So it was just a shame that I didn't have a camera with me in those days, because there was tons and tons of missed opportunities, I'm sure. Um, when I was planning to retire in, in 2009, I thought, well, what am I going to do to keep myself busy? Because after living on airplanes for 30 some years of the 35 years, I thought, what am I going to do? And so digital was coming back in and becoming more established. And I thought, well, I'll buy a camera and I'll take this up again. So once again, the obsession returned. And I've been doing now photography quite seriously for since 2009. Um, when I started doing the digital, of course, it was a whole new ball game, learning Photoshop and now Lightroom came with that, software programs for editing. And so I had to learn that and that was not anywhere like the dark room. I could go into a dark room even today and, and make a decent print but learning the software end of it was quite a challenge. So I started doing things that kind of were easy for me, which was landscapes and architectural stuff. And then one day uh, we went to Seattle and we went to, a matter of fact, the Seattle Art Museum. And afterwards the, of the show, let's go over to Pike Place Market. I had my camera along with me. And that's when I saw, and you'll see in the, on the show's webpage, this photograph here of uh, this couple I call Stand By Your Man. And that was pretty much my first people photograph of that couple. And that really set it for me that I'm gonna work on people photography and specifically street photography. Um, since that time, I've entered a few, sh a few shows, quite a number of juried photography shows, and more recently, juried art shows, mixed arts. And I'm enjoying doing those a lot. Um, it's a good challenge for me to try to push myself either to do a better technique, make a better print, as well as, of course, the subject matter, try to come up with something new and fresh. So street photography, switching gears here a little bit. Um, a lot of people don't understand quite what it is, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit and show some examples of what influenced me and and where it came from. Should I bring up the in a in a sec if you would? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you just give me the give me the cue. When when I was about eight or nine years old, my mom and I were having a conversation once, and she asked me, "What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do?" And now they were both professional people, my dad a doctor, my mom a public health nurse. And I think they expected an answer sort of like that. And I said with a straight face, being eight or nine years old, I want to sit on a park bench and watch people. And I, the reason I remember that conversation was you remember the sound of crickets chirping, you know, it's just silence. So here I am now, 60 some years later, I'm finally sitting on park benches watching people. So it's. I finally got my dream. Um, street photography is, to many, unposed people doing everyday things, 
sometimes unusual everyday things that you catch their eyes. It's semi-documentary. It's a lot of photojournalism style in there. And uh, there's, it's predominantly done in urban situations where there's a lot of people, so you have a lot of subjects to pick from. Uh, I have a hard rule about street photography. And in my mind, at least, a good street photograph, and if you look at most people who are practicing this, go to the same thing. It's got to tell a story in your mind, or it's got to make a story in your mind. And anything else I, I call a snapshot. And the reason I'm kind of cut and dry about that is I look at 20, 30 street photographers a day on Instagram or other places, and there's a lot of people that just wander around going click, 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 and without any thought to who the subject is or what they're trying to, if they're trying to make a statement and if there's a story there at all. So I'm, I'm pretty severe, frankly, about what street photography is. And it's got to tell a story or make a story. That's my, my buzz line for the day. So now, please, if you'd call that up. Sure. And I have to make a slight adjustment here. Just give me one second. Your first slide, so you're OK. OK. First picture slide. So growing up in the, in the 1950s and 60s, some of you may remember who are my age, around my age, may remember that there were three predominant photo magazines, Life, Look, and Ebony. And they were all large format, like 12 by 14, essentially format. And the concept between them behind all of those magazines was that they were to be the news of the day told with photographs and then fill in the blanks a little bit with uh, text and copy. So the people working for them were photojournalists who had come out of the newspaper business, some out of advertising. You had people that were called conflict photographers, in other words, war photographers who had gone to world, were at World War II, the Spanish Civil War, and so forth. And then there's classic street photographers that never did any of the above. They're just started off from day zero as a street photographer. So coming up now are a few um, photographers that left me words of wisdom. And then also I can show some of their pictures. Probably the, the father of street photography is a French guy named Henri Cartier-Bresson. His mantra was it's the decisive moment when do you press the shutter on the camera and think about in his days you didn't have a camera like mine for example that shoots nine frames a second one frame at a time so you got to decide when do you press that button when is the decisive moment and so what what time period is this like early 20th century uh, or? yeah henry uh was like the 30s into the 70s then there's a guy that I'll show a slide for, and this his comment will really ring home once you see his, one of his uh, most memorable photographs. His name is Robert Kappa. Kappa photographed the Spanish Civil War on behalf of Look Magazine and in the times of Hemingway, when Hemingway was also reporting on the Spanish Civil War. Then when World War II broke out, he went on to photograph World War II and a little bit in Korea. And then another kind of words of wisdom is Ansel Adams, who many of you have seen his landscapes, classic black and whites. And he said, and, and I'm taking this to heart, especially now with the pandemic, if you make one photograph a month, it's been a good month. So just go on to uh, our photographers. Next slide, please. So here's Dorothea Lang, and she had a portrait studio in San Francisco. Then the Dust Bowl came along and the Depression came along. And so under FDR's work programs that he was trying to keep artists busy, he hired her, among others, to go photograph people of the Dust Bowl and of the Depression who had migrated places trying to 
get out of the, the poverty that they were in. So this particular picture is in a soup line in San Francisco. And from a storytelling, you gotta make a story or tell a story. I mean, the look on their faces and the fact that that one guy is turned around facing the camera to the others in their back. I mean, there's a story there. One more, please. Okay. Then the one that you, is her most famous photo is of this mother and she's in a refugee camp in Northern California. And she's left Oklahoma and she's got her two kids and uh, the look of despair is it's just right there. That's the story. And that photo in fact has become somewhat the, the icon of the Dust Bowl era of people leaving the, the prairies for the West. Okay. Then an, another of my favorites is Margaret Burke White. She was a New York City advertising photographer and she got sick and tired of doing the advertising photographer photography where there was deadlines and this and that. And this new magazine was going to start and it was called Look Magazine. And she got on and she was with on the very first staff of Look Magazine. So this is a photograph of hers and she was good for placing kind of ironic uh, imagery together. This is a soup line after a hurricane and after a tornado. And these people are lined up and there's this sign of promoting the American way, you know, the happy people in the cars and highest standard of living. And these poor people are just want a piece of bread and a bowl of soup. So I always liked hers photos for that. Yeah, and incidentally, they're all, they're, they're all white in the car yep. as yeah, well. It's the American yeah. family at the time, and, and the, it's all black mm -hmm. people in the line. So mm -hmm. the other thing about Margaret Burke White that I find so interesting is she was the first woman to be allowed to go into combat and photograph as a civilian. Oh, wow. So she was quite a groundbreaker. And I think the next slide, please. And I'm giving you some caution because some of these photos coming up aren't that pleasant to look at. Robert Kappa, who I mentioned, this was coming ashore on D-Day, on, on the first day of D-Day. And the interesting thing about this photograph is that he, the, the press were all in the landing craft with the troops as they were coming ashore, but they were forbidden from coming ashore. They had to stay back while the troops came ashore. And Kappa decided, I'm not gonna get the shot if I stay there. And he came ashore with one of the waves of soldiers at Normandy Beach. He then had a whole bag full of, of uh, film and he told a runner, take this back to London and get it to my editor. What he hadn't factored though, was that that film all got salt water damaged. And this is the only f frame of his that came out of the landing on D-Day. So it explains why it's blurry and looks kind of not as sharp as say the previous picture, but it too has become somewhat iconic. Unposed picture, just like a street photograph and uh, tells the story of, of how horrendous it was coming on the beach on Omaha Beach, say, or Utah on D-Day. Okay, next. Back to Margaret Burke White. Because she was embedded with the Army, in fact, she was with George Patton's uh, tank corps, she was the first still photographer to come on the scene at Buchenwald. And there was a film photographer there, the famous uh, Hollywood director named John Ford and Margaret Burke White. Somebody asked Margaret, how could you take these photographs and do it one after another after another? And her comment was the camera was between me and them and that embraced me for what I was seeing. So again, remarkable that she was there first and, and a role not usual for a man, but male or female. I mean, she's just a great photographer. Um, from the Vietnam era, Eddie Adams. 
Amy Adams, uh, many of you have seen the photograph of the Saigon chief of police uh, putting a gun to the head of a suspected Viet Cong leader. Well, that was Eddie's picture. But he also took this one, which I really like from a photo photography and an art standard, because you've got, I think, a nice composition, but also telling the story. The look on the people's faces is almost like they're numb to the whole violence of what happened in the street. This is probably Tet Offensive days. Uh, what happened on the street? And here's this poor guy, he's dead, and they're just kind of stopped and taking a look. I think numb to it a bit, but I really like the composition on this especially. And to me, um, when I take my street photographs, I do try to get right out of the camera, some good composition. So you'll see some of my photos maybe later, and they're pretty simple. I try to eliminate all the background noise and clutter and just get it nice, simple like this one. Mm -hmm. So you could carry on. And the, and the reason, the next slide, please. Yep. The reason I did, um, oh, one more guy. This is a modern guy. This guy's got a heck of a story as well. Um, he is more in the style of a true street photographer. And Giles Dooley was embedded um, with our troops in Iraq, and then he went to Syria when that conflict broke out. He's, he's English. And he went up there. This poor woman was shot, and she was evac to Lebanon for care. And he went and he followed her, and he wanted to make a story of what happened to her. And in that process, of after he took her picture in a hospital in Lebanon, he too was severely injured, blown up with an IED, ended up losing both legs and one arm. But being a good photographer, he decided he'd go back. When he went back to, to Lebanon, she was still in the hospital two or three years later, and um, he f looked her up and her husband and when he talked to them, they remembered him. He had taken pictures of, of them and their family. And the husband said to him quietly, I hope she loves me as much as I love her. And something clicked in his head and he just said from that moment, I'm gonna to continue to report conflicts, but I'm gonna look for the good in what's going on with the people. And the irony of all of this chaos of war going on around them. However, there's families living, kids playing soccer out on the street and so forth. And in this case, this man and his wife together. So I, I just discovered him, quote discovered, he's been around for a while, but I just found him and I just really like his story. Okay, now we'll get back to the, to the regular street photographers. Here is um, Cartier-Bresson, and he was, as I said, considered, or he is, considered the, uh, the father of, of modern street photography. So here's just a simple couple, probably on a bus or on the subway in Paris. Okay, next slide. Here he was, uh, went down to Spain for the, the uh, Spanish Civil War, and he captured these kids playing. They're again in the middle of a war zone and kids are out playing. So I think it's just a great story that it tells. Okay. And here is an interesting one in Shanghai, probably in the 40s or 50s after the war, early 50s. And there's a run on the bank and these people are lined up trying to convert whatever money they had left in the bank into gold. So there again, telling the story in a simple click, the decisive moment, as, as he used to call it. Another interesting guy that's influenced me, his style, more in the documentaries uh, style. Robert Frank was from Switzerland. He liked America, he loved America, and he wanted to come here and see what it was like to live in an American life. And so what he did was he spent two years and 10,000 miles, as it said in his biography, traveling America, taking pictures of what he saw as American life. And 
um, the style I really like is it's fairly simple and not cluttered. When he would travel around the states, he would literally come to a town and befriend somebody and then would stay with that family for a week or two and really get to know that town or that neighborhood mm -hmm. very well. And so that became his photo style. And he's got, he's published a book, I think it's called On America, about this journey that he was on for two years. Okay, next, please. Here again, this is a good example. There's a couple at the Justice of the Peace waiting to get married. And of course, she looks just absolutely thrilled with the, with the prospect, but they're all dressed up. Now this guy is probably, I think, of the modern era from say the 40s into the 80s, uh, the best photographer. And the reason I say that is, is that he was an all-rounder. He shot advertising, he shot fashion, um, he shot documentaries for, for Life and Look magazines, and to make life more interesting, he was the very first African-American photographer to work for Look magazine. So here's an example of his fashion photography and the little curve he would throw was, I, I looked at this picture, oh, I don't know how many, 20 times. I think that's a, excuse me, a mannequin on the left <laughs> in the blue. But he would do stuff like that just to kind of change up the image a little bit so it wasn't so traditional fashion. Probably early 50s, I think, for this one. The next slide. And because being black, he could photograph where white people couldn't photograph. And so during the height of the civil rights movement, he had access everywhere that, that white people didn't have access to. And this was uh, Parks' statement. This is like American Gothic, but his statement about American Gothic, but during the civil rights movement and this cleaning lady and the flag in the background. So you can see how he posed her. And then also another one of my favorite ones is Diane Arbus. Now Arbus took a little different style of, of street photography. She would go out randomly photographing people, but she would ask them to pose. And this is probably one of her more famous photos of this little guy, and she gave him a couple of hand grenades and one to put in each hand, and then he kind of, you know, made a face for her. But it's really become, I think, a very powerful uh, photograph. And again, it was relatively unposed. I mean, she's, hey, can I take your picture? Okay. Yeah. That's very, very punk. Yeah. That, that photograph. And these two ladies are out for a day in, in the city. And this is uh, two smoking ladies at the automat. So you can see from the style, it was like 1960 or 61. And an automat, for those who don't know, is a robotic, robotic restaurant of style where you'd go and put a quarter in, a door would open up, and you'd take a sandwich out, or you'd take a fruit plate out or something like that. When I uh, worked in New York City, the last of the automats was still there, and it was, was just gone out of business a few years after I worked in New York. So, any questions at this point on, on how I define uh, street photography or questions about the slides that you saw? Yeah, um, Maitri has, um, has a few questions here. Um, that, that have been typed into the chat. Um, the first question, so there are, there are three questions. The first one um, is, John, do you ask permission to take a person's photo if he is up close? I want to re respect people's privacy. No. Uh, the, the, the answer general is no, I don't take permission. I'm somewhat guided by, well, I am guided by the laws, what's permissible. If someone says, hey, don't take my picture, I don't take their picture, of course. And I've had once or twice somebody said, what are you doing? And I show them and I explain what I'm doing and, and so forth. And if they ask to delete the picture, I delete the picture. But in general, uh, street photography is allowed. Anytime you take a photograph in a public place, it's allowed. The big key to it is 
is that you're not to make a commercial, uh, to use it for commercial purposes. So you can sell it as art once in a while, um, but you don't, you're not there to say, I'm running a business selling street mm. photography. Yeah, it really seems like a fine it is line a, it is a and fine a gray line. area of, of... The law is primarily on the side of the photographer. Mm -hmm. And I uh, saw a uh, YouTube video from the British Professional Photographers Association the other day, and it's very similar there too. So as, he, as the guy said there, it's a lot looser in the States than it is here in Britain. Sure. So yeah, I'm respectful. And there's also the side of things where I don't try to show people in a bad light. I don't try to embarrass them with the photograph I take and that I show publicly. Um, so I, I try to be respectful of them when I take my photographs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely a, a deep, a deeper conversation also oh, in, yeah. in terms of spend hours over this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And then the, the next question, uh, from Maitri was, uh, can, can you ask John how he balances telling the tough stories, uh, e.g. poverty, racism, power, and privilege versus lack of power and privilege through his photography with respect for those subjects? Well, there again, that's a deep topic too, because I don't, to be honest, I don't balance one against the other. I mean, if it's a good story and it's a good subject, I do it. I don't try intentionally to tell a story and say, today I'm going to go out and tell a story about this or that. And also, I just want to say, for example, right now in our, our culture and society, for example, I don't take photographs of homeless people. I stopped doing that three or four years ago. And that is because out of respect for those people, primarily, the, the problems have become 10 times more severe than they were 10 years ago when I did take photographs of, of homeless people. So the last thing they want is some old guy with a camera in their face. They've got enough problems to, than to deal with me. Okay, and then the, uh, the last question from Maitri was, um, can you ask John to talk about photography as art versus photography as social commentary? Well, in my case, um, there is some social commentary. Um, I'm going to show a picture here in a little bit of a woman working at a hamburger stand french fry place in Bremerton. And it's, that's my commentary about the whole mass thing and the vacancy of, of restaurants. So I make comments that way, but as art, um, I'm, not, I'm not a artist or a photographer who's trying to make commentary, frankly. I do it rather quite innocently. But do, don't you think um, taking a photograph and hanging in you know, a privileged space like this, I mean, you're, that is making a comment, it is making a statement. Um, the, uh, well, it's deeper than I look at it, let's put it that way. Okay. I'm trying to a large part entertain some of my photographs, mm -hmm. but in large part tell a story. And it's again, as I say, in your mind, do you see a story or is a story made in your mind? Mm -hmm. Well, those are the questions we have in the chat. Does um, before John continues uh, with his presentation, does anyone else have have any questions or comments? You can just unmute yourself, also, if if you like. If not, we'll we'll carry on. Okay. Okay. I'm going to bring up the slide presentation again. There we go. Okay. So because of the the COVID. Um, the ability to photograph people out and about has been severely restricted and limited to me. Obviously, you've got restaurants closed, places that I would normally go, public markets or fest uh, festivals and stuff like that, where I've got a high population density of people, subjects, potential subjects. 
those places are shut down or extremely limited now. So the slides I'm going to show is kind of like, what am I doing now to try to keep my eyes sharp and to keep busy? So that in mind. I've been trying to learn how to use a flash because I don't know, I don't use a flash when I'm out on the street. It's too, in, too invasive. <laughs> and so picture on the left is at McLean Nature Trail and the, the way the light shaft came through on this tree and then the timber behind it, I like. So I threw a flash on it. It's, here it shows a little brighter than it did on my computer, but anyway, a little bit brighter. Yeah, it's a lot of it's the TV monitors. Yeah. Yep. The photo on the right, uh, there was a, probably a 200 year old, 300 year old uh, Western red cedar that had fallen and was leaning. And so I crawled up inside of it and with my flash lit up the inside of the tree and then with the live trees shooting through the hole in the, in the cedar. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to do landscapes, which I really am not fond of doing, but trying to put a twist on it or use whatever uh, in the landscape as a subject the same as a person would be a subject, not just a broad brush landscape type thing, but picking things out in the forest or in a garden, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, asking me about documentary photography and, and so forth, empty tables. So that kind of speaks to the virus right now and how places are closed. Here's an a empty table on the left in Bremerton in front of a now closed coffee shop. Nobody there. Matter of fact, there was nobody on the streets in Bremerton that day. It was amazing how quiet it was. And then here on the right, is a, a table in Shelton, Washington, through the window of the restaurant. And again, it was closed because of the virus. And I really like how the light came through, highlighted certain areas of the restaurant. Yeah, I really appreciate these in, in terms of, you know, with regards to Maitri's question about social commentary and art, you know, sometimes they do overlap and, yeah. and one can inform the other. And um, speak to how some of us may feel too. It's like the the lack of human presence, where you know we may feel like there should be sometimes. I mean, these are yeah, these are really strong photos, and the colors are very bold and, and nicely think, composed. And I think if you didn't pay attention to the art side, the commentary part would get lost mm -hmm. because it would be distracting, in a sense, you know. So you you try to do the arty part of the photography to enhance the story as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, these are really successful in doing that, I think. Um, especially for, for folks around here that might recognize those spaces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a, a gallery in Bremerton called the Collective Visions Gallery, so that's like just around the corner, mm -hmm. the one on the left, and mm -hmm. that the uh, table, the green table there is in downtown Shelton. And Shelton's a great place to photograph because they've got tons of old buildings that are in pretty good shape. They're yeah. all vacant, but I mean, it's fun to photograph there. And also just, I mean, tabletops. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the first things I look at. I don't know about the rest of you all, but when I, you know, you go into a, a small cafe or especially, you know, some, you know, dives, you know, and cafes and bars and I, even I would restaurants. Never go into a dive, oh, I love going into the dives. <laughs> that's that's where the I think the most life is. But no, I do. you know, like this red chair uh, on the left, it's just, you know, do I sit there? Do I want to sit there? Yeah. Who sat there before? You know, and all of these scenarios start and I think coming out of COVID, I, I'm probably going to be asking those questions even a lot more now, yeah. just being aware of that. But they even the chairs and the tables have a character. And, and have their own story, right? And there again, that's what I've been, I, when I have been trying to take photos like that, I've been saying, okay, that's my subject, just the same as the grizzled old couple, mm -hmm. the grizzled couple here at Pike Place Market where, you know, that's my subject. So what character is there? What story can I tell? Yeah. What do those things bring to, yeah. bring to the table, who so sat to speak? There, <laughs> in, in the case of the one on the left, who sat there and wore off the paint? You can see yeah. it's all chipped and rusted. Or how many thousands of people yeah. have sat there and wore it. And now paint. nobody. Yeah. So. yeah. And who's going to fix it? Or does it need to be fixed? Yeah. No, I kind of like the patina. I do, I do too. Yeah. I like it. 
in my in my business travel days, I used to seek out places like that mm -hmm. instead of the McDonald's and Denny's and so forth. So sure. I, I like these places. Yeah. yeah. And here's my. Uh, I kind of thought to myself the other day, this is my ode to Edward Hopper, because his color style is, what's his famous one, Nighthawks at the diner. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a French fry place, again, in Bremerton. And um, in this case, I did ask her if I could take her picture. And I just kind of liked the colors in the place and the, the that, and I ended up giving the, the photograph kind of a wash to get that Nighthawks at the diner look. A little bit. Um, I have a question that kind of popped up here, a comment and a question from Todd. Um, and the comment is, amazing artistic work. Uh, and the question uh, from Todd is, how many photos do you usually have to review before you find the right one? OK. Uh, I was, I was kind of hoping somebody would bring this up. And full disclosure, Todd is my nephew, so it's not a planted question, though. <laughs> uh, I always say when I take a photograph, I take four photographs to get one image like that. Mm -hmm. First photograph is um, finding the subject. And with my eyes, I said, okay, there's something here. Then to get it into my camera, I might take five or six or seven of that same subject. So my second photograph is out of those five or six or seven photographs is which one do I select? Then my third photograph is how do I edit? And then my fourth photograph is what do I print? Or say, okay, I'm done with this. This is okay to, to show or, pr or to print. Um, but think back to the comment from that French photographer, uh, Cartier-Bresson, the decisive moment. He could only take one photograph at a time like that. And modern cameras like mine will take nine frames a second. Right. So you get this really kind of nuancey sort of thing about, you know, is there a smile this way, that way, up, down, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm old school. My photographs, I generally take one or two at a time, like if I was if I was using film and not a not an electronic automated digital camera. Because yeah. I want to make sure I get that decisive moment and don't just let my camera essentially take a motion picture and then you pick out one frame. Right. And that, that's an interesting, um, an interesting approach because, you know, in this day and age, like everyone who has a camera on their phone is a potential photographer. And some folks think they're a photographer. Uh, you know, and if you blast off a thousand, a thousand picks, well, one of those is probably going to be good, right? Yeah. But, uh, but what you're saying is that you know a careful consideration of the subject and the moment. Um, yep, yeah. as the uh, combat photographer Robert Kappa said, the guy who did the pictures of the people coming on the beach of Normandy, if you don't like your picture, if you don't like your photograph, get closer. Yeah. So I kind of work on that, that I closer in the sense that I'm observing is just physical distance maybe, but also that I'm observing mm -hmm. and not just randomly run and gun take shots. Yeah. And my editorial comment is if you look on Instagram and do the hashtag street photography, you see thousands of people taking so-called street photographs and they are just kind of running and gunning and not taking the time to know the subject or to observe. Yeah, there's something here. Um, Maitri says, uh, great textures, and I love to hear John uh, limits his photos instead of doing a blast of photos. I think it helps your eye become more discerning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, in my professional career, I was in sales. And to me, some, a lot of that is carried over. Um, I often used to say, any idiot could make a sale just lower the price. But if you want to make the second and third for sale, it was building a relationship with your customer. And so that carried that over with my photography, build a relationship, even though you're not talking to them, but you are in your mind building that relationship. And 
is it a photo that you want to take yeah. and worthy of it? And will it tell that story as opposed to just hitting nine frames a second or this new one now that uh, Sony makes is 12 frames a second, which they have for sports wow. photography. Yeah. So to me, they're missing the, the experience. Yeah. Okay. Do we want to flip through these or do we want to just talk, yeah, I guess, talk for I guess back to the question about social commentary. As I mentioned, I stopped taking photographs of uh, homeless people. But I did want to show that because I wondered if that question would come up. And um, so I just put in a couple of slides here, extra slides of people I've taken over the years of homeless people. So this fellow was Tacoma. This is one of my favorites. This was in favorites from the standpoint of telling a story in Miami Beach, South Beach, very posh area, lovely hotels and restaurants and Gucci and Coach and all the high-end shops. And then this poor gentleman scrounging around. And I don't normally look to take photos, but it was uh, photos of homeless people, but just him and his story really hit me. This guy was in London, and I don't know, uh, right by Buckingham Palace, in fact. So he looked like he'd had a bit too much that day, one thing or another. Okay. Maitri says, um, with regards to this picture, wow, the person's ribs are echoed in the ribs of the trash can. Beautiful. And as my daughter pointed out, when she saw it, she goes, Dad, he's got dog tags on. Yeah. So then you get the story, is he or was he a veteran? And so, yeah, there's a lot going on here. And, and you know, these, these kinds of images also, you know, we can think about the individual and, and, and the candidness of the moment for that individual, and you're grabbing this shot, but, and it's a commentary on that, but it's also a commentary on that environment that, you know, that, that the figure occupies in the ground and a commentary on society. Um, just looking at the, the window in the back, you know, it's a cafe and a pharmacy combined, all these bottles of water, um, the palm trees, you know, are very ordered and organized. They've been planned to decorate um, and, and so on and so forth. And there's a cafe and the, you know, right behind him with the chairs. And so there's big, big, this structured environment that that's being cared for and maintained and, and traveled on and, and there's commerce, but then um, it's not really doing its job. Yeah. Right. Yep. So it's a commentary about us as much as it is about the people in the photographs. Yep. Here's one in Seattle. Um, we go to Seattle usually the week before Christmas or so and do our Christmas shopping and have a nice meal out together. And while well, wife and daughter are often out doing shopping, I'm out wandering around with my camera and I just saw this guy and he had a cat. <laughs> the, the cat was there, and so I did give him money for cat food. Oh, May Trey also said, um, commenting on the the thin figure of the man next to the trash, um, the thin figure um, juxtaposed with the vertical lamp. Yeah. Um, sorry, May Trey, I kind of ad libbed there with your <laughs> with your comment, but. And this was probably one of my last photographs of, of homeless people or the drug and mentally ill that are out in the street these days and really having a tough time. And this poor guy, this was by the uh, Washington Historical Museum on Pacific Avenue in Tacoma. Not having a good day. Same with this guy. Now, is there is there some editing that that goes on here? I I'm not seeing you in the reflection in the in the mirrors in the in the windows, or is are you just 
Is his figure obscuring you? I mean, you're thinking about that. Oh yeah, I try to be careful and it's ruined more than one shot by mm -hmm. the reflection in a window. So I try to position myself so I'm not. Mm -hmm. But I, I use a wide angle lens and it'll take in a ton of information and oftentimes I'll go pick out a piece of it like this guy here. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you'd seen the whole width of the frame, possibly you'd see that I was in the, the window, but now I decided not to include myself there. Mm -hmm. uh, Maitri says, uh, this photo is very painterly. This too could be a painting. Uh, that little snick of red makes the photo. Yep, and there again, um, my style is, is more in a painterly fashion and not classical um, street photography. Classical street photography going back to the 30s and 40s is black and white, very high contrast. Um, I'm making portraits is kind of how I look at it. So I'll, I'll make it a little painterly. In fact, the photo that won the Merit Award this year was at the Puyallup Fair and of a street busker. And I just looked at that photo and I said, you know, that's a, that's a carnival or a, a circus poster. So I pulled up the colors on that and really made it oversaturated, but kind of like how a poster would be for when the circus came to town. And here's uh, this poor guy in Olympia and that's by the old YMCA downtown. So we're kind of going on with a little extra here, but again, I, the, the four photos I talk about, what I do and my style um, is more in the painterly fashion as opposed to just straight photojournalist type, take the thing and give it to your editor and that's as much as done to the photo. These people are at the Seattle Art Museum and it was the Gauguin exhibit. And I agree with them, it was a very boring exhibit. And so they'd park themselves on a, on a bench and I just kind of sympathized with them. For my taste anyway, it was a boring exhibit and I was disappointed by it. So she's yawning, the guy on the far right, he's looks like he's all done in for the day. Mm -hmm. Next one. Here's kind of more painterly style, drinking a cup of coffee in Vancouver at a, at a bus stop. And somehow I got the steam. I don't know how I did that. It was a good accident. Maitri asks, uh, is John familiar with Eugene Aget, A-T-G-E-T, -E a French photographer, 1857 to 1927? I think he would like Aget's photos very much street photographer no i'm not familiar with them but now i'll go look for sure what next this is uh one of my big influences is norman rockwell growing up in the 50s and 60s with saturday evening post covers coming into the house and this guy was in that old bank building downtown olympia during art walk and I just got a kick out of him, how he was inspecting and bent over, got up close to the, the art that was on display. And if you notice reflections, he's reflected on the, the art that's off to his far left, off to the left of the image. So he, he's looking and his image is looking back at him. Mm -hmm. um, Scott Fix. Yep. Um, says, unfortunately, we have to run, but John, thank you for sharing so eloquently your passion and the stories behind each. Your work is always so impressive to follow online, and it's such a pleasure to be able to hear you speak about it. Let's have hot dogs and talk art next time we're in the PNW, Marcus okay. and Scott. And to Scott and Marcus, mahalo. Thank you. <laughs> They're in Hawaii, so. Yeah, excellent. This is in the coffee shop. This is again kind of doing the, the Main Street, Edward Hopper's style maybe, but also the Norman Rockwell and these guys are having her cup of coffee downtown, right there by the market at that uh, Dancing Goats. Oh, across from the Saturday market? Yes. Yeah. what they got. 
I just like the colors together and the fact, you know, they were just staring out the window having their cuppa. Okay, this is a guy, this is more kind of a Norman Rockwell style fellow who's in Centralia. And I just kind of like him. I know it's really two dimensional, flat. There's not much depth to the thing, the way it, the light hit him, but just the whole idea. And he had a great face, great hands. And so when, when we're looking at a photo like this, um, uh, how much post production is, is going on with the photos? Like how, how much are you are you editing, um, you know, black points and and highlights and things like that? Well, the the image that most quote unquote professional cameras take, they call them raw files, mm -hmm. and they take a ton of data, but they don't do anything to the data when it comes into your camera. It just comes in, and they're very flat, mm -hmm. and then they leave it up to you to raise the saturations. So I will, I will look at this and for example, uh, photographically speaking skin, regardless of whether you're black or white or Asian, tends to be on the orange side. So I just kind of dropped the orange on this because I wanted it to have sort of a faded out look like a, an old evening post type photograph. And then I brought up his jacket to blue because that's what I wanted the focus point to be. And then last that little picture on the wall I had a heck of a time with that. They didn't have my camera level, and then as a result, the the picture on the wall looked like it was falling over. The perspective lines had gone off, so I had to try to straighten that up too. And that forced me to actually, I didn't have much photograph left to work with when I was done, but from a balance standpoint, I kind of like it because it's a little image up there on the left and it balances him off on the right. Again, down in Olympia on Capitol Lake. And there I darkened up the sky to give that forbidding look, foreboding look, I guess you'd say. Is that David Lynch walking, <laughs> walking towards Lynch. The, the lake? You know, the, the film yeah. filmmaker. He just came from the set of the TV show Big Sky, and he's in Olympia now. So. Yeah, and with, the, with that ominous sky, it just yeah. it really... Uh, has that Lynchian kind of. But see, that's the nice part, whether you, you're in a dark room or on a computer, you know, you, you burn that down to kind of frame him. Mm -hmm. So he's a subject, otherwise it would just be a white sky. I love the, the charcoals in, in, that, in those darkened clouds um, with that, that green of the grass, that darkened grass, I mean, there's, it's a really lovely palette. And there again, from an editing standpoint, I changed the tone of the grass a little bit to make it that putty green to match the gravel. Mm -hmm. Matri says, I like the dancing of the trees against the foreboding sky and flat path. Okay, uh, Father's Day weekend every year at the the Olympia Airport, they have an air show, and it's a lot of it's historical aircraft, but that's why the, the guy on the left is dressed up in World War II period costume. They sh a lot of people show up, so I always get a kick out of it. Um, for the guy, people who show up for the air show, in this particular year, the Marines flew in one of their modern aircraft and so that drew a lot of people. And so standing there in the crowd watching this as it was getting ready to take off, I like the shape of the guy's head and I like the shape of the army helmet. Army helmet, guy's head, there were some similarities there. So I took this photograph between the two of them. And that, that was a loud aircraft too. So that's why he was holding his ears. Matri says, what the heck is that? Okay, that aircraft is a, a VR-22 Osprey, which is half helicopter, half airplane. And they can take off vertically, vertically as well as like a traditional airplane and horizontally. So, and this is kind of like your more traditional street photography in black and white, high contrast. And these two ladies were in the beer garden 
at the uh, 4th of July celebration down at the Tacoma waterfront. And they were looking for somebody who was coming to visit or to meet up with them. So I just kind of liked the far off look. I don't think it was probably anything more than a friend was coming to visit them, but yet there's kind of this distant look off into space, into the future, who knows. And that's me, which is a scary photograph in itself. All right. Um, well, if anybody has any other questions or if you want to see any other artwork, I'll leave the, the presentation up here. But if you have any questions, you can uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, or you can type in the chat. Um, whatever you like to do. Um, if you want to see some other images, like I said, I'll, I'll zip back through the, the presentation and, and find some. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, what was that? I'm, I'm sorry, we didn't quite catch that. Thank you for sharing your art. art. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing your art. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you all for taking the time. And uh, Connie Mernon says, John, the thing we love about your photos is that they always bring our emotions to the surface. We get to tell ourselves a story filtered through your own experience. Thank you, Connie. That's really nice, yeah. All right, uh, Sandra's iPhone says, so appreciate hearing and seeing another point of view of an artist. I wonder if that's Sandra Bocas. Hey, John, this John. is me. Yep, hi. Hey, thank, thank you hey. so much for your presentation. I love your work. I, I don't know you. I haven't ever seen your work before, so this is wonderful. Um, I. Probably from my questions, you can tell that I struggle with um, taking, you know, wondering whether I should take photographs of people without asking them. And I know I went to Mexico City once and took very few pe pictures of people there because I felt like I should ask them first and I didn't know any Spanish. Uh, but I, I was just, I fell in love with their faces and, you know, the different facial structures that they have because they come from so many different places down there. Um, but anyway, I, I just, in general, I love your work and it's, it's, many of them are so painterly. I could just, they just look like, they almost already look like a painting. And so your use of, of all the, you know, all of the uh, tools um, that a painter would use, you are using with your camera, you know, the shapes and the values and the positive and negative space and um, and you know, in the subject matter and the and the lyricism, the movement from left to right and up and down and all of that, um, just wonderful. And I'm sure you spend lots of hours. Um, I used to work in the dark room, and I spent hours and hours in the dark room at a green. And I'm sure that you spend as many, probably more hours now, playing with the pixels as you did in the dark room. But your pictures don't show it. I, I really take umbrage when I look at somebody's photos and it looks like they've obviously been photoshopped and they've punched up the color everywhere and and it's like like can I ever can I ever just look at a at a photograph of something that somebody's actually taken out there in the real world and your photographs still look real to me. So thanks a lot. I really um, I'm I'm really um, enjoyed seeing your work. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the hardest things to do when you're editing now, especially with computers, is when to take your finger off the computer, when to say enough's enough. Um, I think probably people who draw or paint have similar problems, but with a computer, you can always go back and hit reset and do it over again. And that causes people to maybe keep going one step too far because they know they can clean up their mistake. So yeah, I'll, I'll spend four or five days on an image. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do it and then I won't like it. I'll even put it on my screensaver on my computer. So I look at it over <laughs> and over and over. But I, as I try to do is, is to do everything I could have done in the dark room, except on a computer. And I maybe I'll punch up the colors a bit more, but I try to stick to that. I don't put people in the picture. I don't take them out of the picture. Once in a while, if there's a piece of litter on the street, I'll take it out if I find it distracting. But mm -hmm. essentially, I try to use old style darkroom logic 
And thank you for your, your comments about composition. Um, when I was an undergrad working on my economics degree and the, the passion for photography started, I took two formal composition classes, uh, composition and design classes, and they were out of all my four years in university, they were my two favorite classes. And they really stuck it with shows me. shows so in I, your photography. I try to remember what I learned there back in 73, 72, excuse me. Thank so, you. Yeah, it so shows perhaps, in your photography. Yeah. So, um, and perhaps you said this, but, <clears throat> excuse me. So when did you return to photography? When did you start picking up the camera again? 2009, 2009. when I retired. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I'd gone 35 years had point and shoot camera type things, you know, and when my daughter, our daughter was born, we had little point and shoots, but my, my good Nikon, I just, it was in the bag the whole time. I think I took it out once, I went to a bicycle race in, the, in Manhattan on a Saturday morning. And Eric Hyden at the time was the big deal with the speed skating at the Olympics and he was riding in that race in Manhattan. So I went into, into the city to watch the race and. Mm -hmm took my camera in for that. But for the most part, it stayed in the bag. And, yeah. you know, lack of wish, desire to do it. No dark room either that I had access to. That was a good part of it. But. Um, Sandra says, the care in your work keeps it sacred, which as far as I'm concerned, transports an unspoken feeling. Thank you. That's very nice. You know, it's it, interesting too. I just like to comment that the review of the show, uh, Alec made a comment that my photographs kind of had a sense of loneliness. And I'd never thought of that before, but I've gone back and looked at the ones I put in the show and some of these others, and he's got a point. There is kind of a, not a loneliness, but I mean, it's just a, one subject's in the picture at a time, and maybe it does portray kind of loneliness or mm -hmm. isolation, but that's kind of my style, I guess. So I have a question um, also about, um, about uh, the, the size of the work. Um, have you printed in other formats or is this? Yeah, uh, for, for the show, I wanted to do just eight by tens and the original intent was if I had a, a single wall, there was gonna be like six photos along in a row. Mm -hmm. So I wanted them all eight by 10 so I could fit them on the space that we were allowed. But normally my, my prints are 11 by 14 inches. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not for quality reasons, it's just kind of a size and it's frankly the expense that if I decide to frame them, things exponentially go up in cost. Absolutely, yeah. I don't have my own printer. I send it off to a professional printer so things go up in cost when you go above 11 by 14 inches. Right. But that's my normal format. Okay, and um, I, I have another question for you. So, um, so what what are you thinking next? Do you have thoughts for like where where you might well, point your point your lens? Yeah, I'm really kind of stymied because, like I said, there's nobody on the streets or those those large people population type events that I like to go to. Mm -hmm. the, the cities, there's nobody yeah. there, and then the homeless issue, the drugs, and that. I'm 70 years old. I'm not a speedy 16 year old athlete I once was. So when I'm dealing with people who got some serious issues and don't like me taking their photographs, mm -hmm. I can't blame them. You know, it's, it just makes it more difficult for me to be out and about. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm kind of, I've been, this show, which I did want to make a comment about what the show and this conversation has meant to me and that. So quite a bit of introspection has gone into preparing for tonight, and it's been really good, really, really interesting. And that question came up, like, now what, John? What are you going to do? And one thing that I, I come away from this, and I will say what did it for me, is when I came into the show and I saw Marilyn Bedford's um, paintings over here. She has one of a fire, and it was a smoke. And I thought, oh, that's pretty simple. I like it. And why did she do that? I thought about my own stuff and then hers, and I came to the conclusion, this is just my, my opinion, people who do art are first and foremost observers. 
they're not people who can paint this or draw that or sculpt that. They observe something that causes them to use a medium that they're comfortable in representing what they saw. That's kind of deep, heavy for me. But anyway, they're observers first. And so that's kind of what preparing for this tonight, I mean, it, it formed in my mind. So who knows what I'm going to do next? I mean, I hope I get the chance to go back and do some more street photography. But like I go into the forest, I take a picture of just a stump, not the whole forest, and treat it like it was a, a single subject. So we'll have to see. It's going to be it's interesting. Fortunately, I've got almost 20,000 images on my computer. A lot of them are duplicates. A lot of them are forest and flowers and bunnies and stuff like that. But from there, I've gone back and I've started to rework some of those. But I am going to have to get out and get something new going here. Otherwise, I'll be climbing the walls. Excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, OK, a couple of comments here. Kristen says, what I like about his photography is that you can get the sense of respect he has for his subjects. He provides a space for the viewer to create a story for themselves, but works to highlight a moment in time in a way that creates emotions and vulnerability that we can all relate to on some level. I'm, of course, biased as his favorite and only daughter. She's and, my favorite daughter, yes. <laughs> and then uh, Connie uh, sa uh, is asking, which one captures the best story for you, digital or film, and why? Dave and Connie. Well, first to Kristen, um, if she ever decides to turn herself loose and work at photography, she'd run circles around me. She's got a really great eye. Um, and to the question, which is better, or which do I like better, film or digital? If I could, I would do only film. And technical, I, I like the color better. And the black and white, I like the image better, and I'm a lot more comfortable with it. And I love being in a dark room. But film isn't that available anymore. And uh, the film cameras are hard to service. So I'm stuck with digital, and this is, you know, old dog learning a new trick. If there are any more questions or com oh, wait a minute. Holy cow, am I missing? No. Did I miss some? No, I think I got them all. Yes. Got all the stuff in the chat. All right. Um, well, if we don't have any any other comments or questions, um, John, thank so, you very so, much. Thank you very much, and again, uh, congratulations on the show and oh, putting thanks. it all together. Yeah, same to you. Single-handedly, <laughs> it'll be a little easier now. Yeah. And right. to those of you that are in ninety-degree Phoenix or very warm beach on the Gulf Coast of Florida, I'll get revenge yet. <laughs> Hey, John. Right. Yes, ma'am. John, I if you're if you're struggling to find somebody that works on film cameras, I don't know if he still does, but there was a guy named Andy Adams in Olympia that used to service film cameras that you might check out. Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I sold my film camera to buy my first digital camera. So, <laughs> the camera, three lenses, a motorized drive, got me one camera and one lens. 10 years or 20, 10 years ago. Thank you very right. much. It was great. If, you, if yeah. you're looking at photography, come on down to Florida. There's plenty of people on the beach still. And I can tell you that when Uncle John came down, he consistently and always had his camera with him looking, scanning and looking. And he, and he got a couple really great shots of people, uh, which I'm sure you've seen um, on the beach as well. And I didn't exactly know what he was doing because it was years ago but um these photographs showed up in the pacific northwest at at the art uh contests and and uh that's when i knew he was uh what he was up to and um just just always always working and always looking for the shot even on the beach when everybody else is relaxing so and i think that's how he relaxes ultimately yeah. as well 
And who can forget the pig races in Plant City? <laughs> pig races in Plant City. Uh, yeah, Florida isn't always beaches. There's also <laughs> there's there's also country for sure. So all kinds yeah. of things to see here, as you probably see on the news constantly. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, just really really great stuff. So. Thank okay. Well, yeah. Well, thank you all for um, everyone for coming uh, to listen to John. And um, you can, uh, of course, visit the website at spscedu slash gallery um, and- And if you, have, if you right. have further questions or whatever on the last slide, there was my email and, and my website. So you could contact me there if you had additional questions later. All right. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye everyone. Good night, thank you.